Well, hey, everybody. Welcome in today. I am, of course, Steve with Retro Tech, and I have a special guest joining me today. Uh, just a second to let everybody kind of catch up and get in here as this show comes online. I realize that, you know, where I live, it's 920 in the morning on a Tuesday. So the majority of people in my area are probably at work. But if they catch a stream, I have been told that they like to watch it while they're supposed to be doing some work. But um, anyway, I'll be joined today by a very special guest uh, from Digital Foundry. I have John Lineman here. And uh, John is coming to us live from Europe to discuss everything about the B&O CRT. And uh, so thank you, John. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> happy happy to be here, Steve. You know, I love talking CRTs anytime, <laughs> any place. And yeah, since I live in the land of the B&Os, I figured what better thing to talk about. Because I went on an adventure this week, uh, weekend, I suppose, to obtain one. Yeah, I was uh, I was following you closely. I had been so busy this past weekend with this Retro World Expo. is one of the big expos that us all retro guys get together and and everybody does in uh, Connecticut. And then right when I got back to town, I started getting these amazing pictures you were sending me of this crazy Bang & Olufsen television and uh, myself just getting done working on one. I thought, what a great time to get together and kind of talk about these amazing machines. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, I see a lot of people starting to come into the chat. This is great. And, uh, we'll, uh, we already have Bob in Bob's coming in asking if, if you didn't, if you've already used thunder and paradise on it. Well, yet. <laughs> I will explain why we haven't when we get into okay. uh, more, <laughs> more details about how this thing works and what's going on here. All right. Well, yeah. So I think this is probably good enough. I mean, it's only been a couple of minutes, but if you are joining us and uh, the stream will be up and I will probably, you know, re-release this as a video a little bit. So it, it doesn't just disappear into the live stream ether. Cause I think it'll be a good conversation. Uh, but Oh yeah, that happens a lot. Yeah, you know, after a couple of days, it just disappears. So we're gonna. Um, I'm gonna throw it over to John. I'd love to him for him to explain everybody about uh, this specific again B and O C R T, um, and you know just more about it. Although, so yeah, okay, this all kind of comes back to uh, years ago, right? I discovered the existence of a B&O CRT with a built-in CDI player. You know, the Philips CDI, uh, the Prince of the Netherlands, the Dutch, you know, it's it's amazing, right? Or not, but it was actually a big deal over here, weirdly enough, and a lot of people I've met from there actually have experience with it. But it turns out that one of the things uh, my buddy Audi Surly of Limited Run Games and DF has, we've, we've always loved talking CDI, playing CDI games, uh, sometimes to come and get comedic effect, sometimes for actual fun. It varies. I mean, you know how the CDI is, but this C this CRT with the built-in CDI has been sort of on Audi's list of dream CRTs for years. Ever since I showed that it existed to him, he was like, I need to get this thing. But they're not that easy to come by, and years passed. In that time, I picked up my first B&O CRT this year, the B.O. Vision 1. I kind of like it. I think it's great. I was impressed by it. You know, I'm mostly surrounded by pro monitors, but I enjoyed getting the taste of something consumer. And just like the the design of the unit impressed me a lot. So I kind of kept an eye on these things. And recently, this B.O. Center AV5 showed up for sale. There was exactly one for sale that I could find in all of Germany. And it happened to be about an hour away from me. Uh, last week I was at Gamescom in Cologne and all of my colleagues, Alex, Richard were there. So was Audie and Audie drove up with me and his buddy Tom to Gamescom. And we knew we were going to come back the following weekend after we survived the show. And I was like, dude, there's an AV5 for sale and not too far from my house. What do you want to do? <laughs> and he's just like. You know, he lives in Norway and North Carolina, depending on the time of the year or what, what's going on. But it's not that close, right? Uh, well, it turns out he actually wanted to go get it with the plans of actually loading into a truck in the future and hauling it back up to Norway. But for the time being, I said, all right, 
if we go get this thing, I'll keep it at my house and my setup for the time being. And when you're ready, we'll we'll take it up there. So we drove down to get it. The guy <laughs> had it in a basement and was like, well, we can't, you can't test it, uh, but you can sure take it. <laughs> So we went down there, we, we saw the unit, we gave him the money. Uh, he had sent photographs of it working. It showed that CDI was supported. He had tested a burned copy of Zelda, uh, like the <laughs> Wand of Gamelon on there, and it worked. But one of the weird things we noticed right when we picked it up was he was he said, yeah, most of these have uh, controller ports for the CDI back here, pointing to where this S-Video output was. But this one doesn't have it for some reason. But I wasn't familiar enough to understand what that actually meant yet. So we we took it, right? We we right. hauled it into my car. It's 70 kilos, like 160 pounds or so. All right, right, it's right. Hang really on, right. freaking heavy. Yeah, I was going to say, let's stop right here for a second, okay? And, and, yeah. and just to keep this story. Like, when we're going, you guys go, and, and um, is this person that you got it from, was it another person that was like, I mean, if they had a burnt copy of... Uh, a CDI game, I would have to imagine they were into gaming, right? It's not just yes. like an old person's no. one that was in their basement. It's a dude that had three other B&Os. Okay. Uh, and this one being as big and heavy as it is, he basically ran out of space for it and was like, yeah, I needed to sell it. And okay. that's what he did. So he put it down in his storage locker under his apartment, and that's where it was. So, so you guys had to get it all. Did you? Was it a struggle to get it out, or was it actually well, easy, it like the elevator or something? He, so, because he had it in a basement, we actually were able to load it up on a dolly and okay. wheel it out into like the garage area. And there's this undercover, like garage section of the apartment building, so I could pull my car down there. Uh, I've got a large hatchback trunk. On okay, my that's car, what I was about to ask next. Which, was what which was that? great. Was like, okay, good. Yeah, so I, I have one of the the B and W or the not B and O BMW <laughs> four series Grand Coupes. So it's like a four door car, but it's got a big old uh, hatchback trunk, right? Okay. So I'm able to like, you know, there's a ton of space in there for this, and we were able to lift it up the three of us, set it gently in the back of the car, which was pretty difficult to achieve. Uh, made sure it was lying down sort of face first, but protecting it with the sort of plastic wrap around the tube and around the bezel. And we just got it in there snugly and went on our way and drove back another hour to get back to my house. And that's when the struggles began in terms <laughs> of lifting it. Because we had to lift it back out of this thing yeah. into my house. And so this thing actually has some pretty good carrying handles. And it, it's a good... Th there's... There's specific points designed for carrying this thing that helped a lot, but even still, it's pretty heavy, right? It is a solid machine. Uh, it's a mix of the tube. There's tons of metal in there and wood and just like, all these circuit boards. Thick, people need to understand this is a luxury product. It is like not cheap wood. It is, it's no. like high quality, high cost, thick, dense wood that really adds a ton of weight to these TVs. Yeah, it, it feels super premium, and it's got, like, this sort of paint finish. We got this burnt orange color, like you see there on the stream. Yeah. That's beautiful in person. It's sort of pearlescent. It actually reminds me of, like, car paint. It's it's really nice looking. I was impressed by that in person. Uh, but anyway, we get it into the house and set it up. And the first thing, I guess, so we'll get to cleaning, but the first thing, we just wanted to test it and see how this bad boy works. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's obviously a shot that's coming up, but yeah, you Sorry, know, I plugged I it in, up. flipped it on, and it it came right up. <laughs> and of course, being one of these B and O TVs, it has the mechanical rotating stand. So you hit power, it rotates into place. But it has some other tricks up its sleeve. I'd heard about this, but it's amazing seeing it in person. Is the the speakers? Uh, so it has a subwoofer in the back that's hidden. But then it has these two speakers on the on the left and right. You can see it there on the web page, right? Right. But so those, here. Uh, when the system is turned off, they retract inside the body. When you power like it up, in into the body. Yeah. So yeah, so correct. it looks like this when, picture. When it's turned off, is that yes. right? When it's turned off, it looks like that. When you power it on, the thing rotates and the speakers push their way back out at the same sort of speed. So it's all in sync. Yeah. So like it rotates, the speakers come out, and then they have this effect where it sort of opens <laughs> like a curtain in front of the CRT. Yeah. 
So it's like it's designed to like present itself to you in a cinematic fashion every time you hit power. Uh, and it looks <laughs> awesome. Like it's just like, okay, this feels premium as heck. And it is. Yeah. Uh I love that about it. So but then it's like, all right, let's let's look let's start with a music CD just to make sure the laser works. Well and, and so here's we a actually... rudimentary picture of the back too before we look at your specific one. But yeah, there yeah, yeah. is that subwoofer you were talking the, the about in the very bottom of it. That's right. There's, there's a subwoofer down there, uh, and it's beefy. <laughs> so <laughs> we started with a music CD. I grabbed uh, a copy of Phil Collins' Greatest Hits because <laughs> why not? Of course, <laughs> it, fe- it felt suitable for this for this e- <laughs> this era. And for, holy crap, the the sound quality. Yeah. Uh, actually, before even that, the tray quality. So you can't really see it too easily. Is like on top there where the cd tray opens up Mm -hmm. uh that thing is mechanical right it's so you press a button and it it opens up in the smoothest possible fashion it's like very nice and smooth picture of that yeah that's uh uh hang on a second actually oops sorry let me yeah you can't really see it up there no not from that picture but if i get back to the folder here we go let me scoot that um yeah, if I go uh, over here to the picture, yeah, there, there it this is. This one, it's it's right that, there. that one. There it okay. is. That's the picture. So we'll go bring this one over the, here. Yeah, there it view. is. And... So you see that when you ins- so that lid lifts up, and there's actually a pair of lights that shine inside, sort of illuminating the tray. It's like is it this? It's this moment of truth, this consumer moment of truth, where it's just like, please, good sir, place your compact disc within me. <laughs> and you're just like, okay, all right. So we drop the disc in there, press the button, the tray smoothly closes. You can see that in the front and the back, the disc itself protrudes from the unit. So you can actually see it spinning live. So that's that's actually the... while it's playing, it sits there yeah, like that? It, it, exactly. Whoa. It's wild. Uh, so that stays lit up. And then along the top bezel there, directly to the right of the CD tray, there's actually a series of lights that light up based on the number of tracks it detects on the disc. So you get this readout of all the tracks on the disc, and based on which track you're on, it's it highlights it. So it's this really fancy looking thing where you're just like, okay, this is rad. And then the music starts playing, <laughs> and like the de- the depth of the sound and the bass, like it actually genuinely took me by surprise because i am a home theater guy I've, I've put a lot of money into my speakers and it's not going to match that per se but this thing is it sounds better than just about any like standard sound system you could buy it sounds better than any sound bar i've ever heard in my entire life it sounds better than any other tv i've ever heard in my life i was genuinely shocked by the quality like the depth of the bass and the clarity it's like how the heck does this thing sound this good? I think all of us were sitting in the room, like looking at each other, like, God damn. It was it was powerful. Like the, the quality of the sound is top tier. And I think that feeds into why they have this like really heavy case full of metal and wood, is that they want to keep it completely steady. There's zero rattling, there's no like noise or vibrations or anything. It just it's <laughs> rock solid. Right, and so it knocked my socks when, off. when the sound comes on because this is like my life in gaming asked if uh against <laughs> all odds was the song i was gonna ask what was that song that just like popped on at the phil collins the phil collins song that just was like boom oh. like the first thing like you see the cd spin and then it just hits the first track well what is it <laughs> it's um i think it was easy lover by oh. by uh phil collins the one that sounds like uh that is awesome. double dragon too yeah so it's totally it's totally double, double dragon just ripped that song off right like this yeah. is straight up st- stage stage two the rooftops <laughs> of double dragon it's that song <laughs> It has great bass, so it's awesome. That is incredible. Wow. So, I, you know, okay. I tried just a little joke here, John. I tried to convince my wife to let me uh play Easy Lover as one of our dance songs at our wedding, and she totally shut me down. That was like the only thing she said no to. But oh, that's continue. hilarious. <laughs> so okay. First impressions, awesome. Then I run upstairs and grab a stack of CDI games. It's like, all right, let's 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 see how the CDI works. So the first thing I do is pop in a copy of Tetris. You know, 
the famous version of Tetris for the CDI, <laughs> where it presents the, the play field on a large monolithic object nestled within natural scenes uh, with very calming music. It's a wonderful thing. It's a very serene version of Tetris. Uh, pop it in, get to the main menu. First thing I know is, you know, if you've used the CDI, by default, it actually comes with IR remotes, right? So you're actually kind of using this IR remote to control mm -hmm. the cursor on the screen. Um, and so I do that, load up the game of Tetris and start to play. Uh, you know, obviously the soundtrack on here is not Redbook audio, so it's actually somewhat compressed sounding, but it's still suitably impressive. The Tetris game looks awesome. I noticed immediately that it's running in RGB. Okay. So the, the image quality is pristine. Uh, European CDIs do often ship with RGB. So I, you know, my CDI has RGB, but the smaller, the 450, the consoleized CDI does not have RGB. None of the American units have it. You need to mod it in, right? So picture quality, excellent. Even better, if you go to the, the options menu within the TV itself, there's an option, you select CD and it shows like music CD, video CD, all these different like options with the with the ability to specify PAL or NTSC. And that includes CDI, so you can set the CDI to whichever you prefer. So we set it to NTSC, which is the shot you're seeing there. That's running in NTSC mode, it's full screen. Works without a problem. Yeah, so, I, I talked to to other people about it and they, and they were explaining to me that they could run in either PAL or NTSC, which kind of blew me away for a consumer set. Yeah, that's freaking cool, right? Yeah. And the TV itself obviously supports NTSC and PAL as well, right, for external inputs. But for the internal thing, it's yeah. rare to see a, an actual CDI unit that allows you to select which one you want. That was cool. Uh, then I pop in my copy of Lost Eden which is a very cool game from Cryo, French developer Cryo. First thing that happens, a menu pops up and says, you need the uh, CDI digital video card to play this title. Shoot. So we immediately hit this brick wall. Of it's kind of like, well, that's not good. Uh, so not every, most CDI games don't actually require the DVC, but there's a fair number that do. Uh, so not having that is a bummer. And more on that in a bit once we open this unit. The next thing we no we noticed, uh, there's no controller ports on here, just as the guy said. Like a back on on the back of the TV, along the upper lip, uh, there's an S video jack and a headphone jack. But there's also supposed to be composite video input, uh, two RCA inputs. Actually, I don't know if it's input or output. I haven't tested. Uh, yeah, find the right picture. Okay. You can kind of see it. Hang on. All right. Uh, I guess just find the rear the shot. Rear shot, out, right? Where it's Even open. Where this is fine. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, one. that'll be fine. Just showcase what Let I'm talking about. Move this folder over here so I can look at it while we're talking. Get it ready, kinda. Yeah. This is this is how Oops. we roll. All right, I know. It's... Okay, come back here. There we go. Okay. There it is. Okay, bring that baby in. <laughs> All right, right. So the graphics team is working hard today. <laughs> <laughs> if you look, Steve, up there along the top left edge. Uh, like up in this see... area over here? Yeah, right there. Right in that I area. You can see my handiwork. It's not great. I need to file that down a little bit. Uh, okay, right. So you see those buttons there. Beneath that, on the left there, you have the headphone jack. To the right of that is an S-Video jack. In between there, there's supposed to be RCA plugs. And then to the right of the S-Video jack further... You see that right there, there's two controller ports. Obviously, spoiler, they're there, but <laughs> by default, they're not. It's covered by plastic, right? You can't actually access them. So we didn't know what was going on there. So right now, we're at the state, no DVC games, no cable-based controller, just the IR from the, B in it, from the BO4 remote, by the way. So playing games with the BO4 remote, not the best thing, yeah. doesn't work well. <clears throat> So we basically also what you're saying is this yeah. is Ed, like, so just to get, I know you see, people see this on the screen right now, but when, before, before this, you didn't see this. You just saw a block of plastic right over Correct. this area. So it, it was wasn't just revealed. Flush. You just saw this S video just and, the S -video that, and the audio and the headphones. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Uh, so I'm like, well, dang, that's, that's not cool. Right. Um, then there is the last matter 
and this one we're not actually sure about, is that games from the Vision Factory, like The Apprentice uh, and Demos Quest, which is honestly not very good, but it's funny. Yeah. Those games don't load on this thing at all. They just are detected as music CDs. Hmm. And looking into it, it seems like very select CDI games use some special sort of method for booting. I can't recall the name. And those don't seem to work on this unit for some reason, and I need to investigate that further. But okay. by and large, what I found is most of the library that we tested works fine, as long as it doesn't have the DVC requirement or it's one of the Vision Factory games. So everything boots up, but you can't play it with a controller. And that's where we were Sunday evening before we all settled in to watch the AEW all-in <laughs> pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> spinning you're like all right that's enough break time to pay-per-view exactly. and how was the pay-per-view by the way it was excellent it was Good. a fantastic one there's some amazing <laughs> matches in there yeah I, I really enjoyed it yeah thanks to audi for uh shelling out for it brought back old memories oh those are fun. so we had a great we had a great day it was a good time uh so the next day comes around and in the late afternoon we were like all right let's uh Let's dig back into this bad boy and play around with it some more. So the first thing we did is I actually decided to check out the SCART inputs there. You see on the back, it's got three SCART inputs, which is excellent, by the way. That's just awesome having three, you know, you have three RGB inputs right there waiting for you. So I grabbed my one of my Genesis 2 32X Sega CD combo, plugged that bad boy in and fired it up. And sure enough, great rgb picture looks awesome i played a bunch of games on there you know it's one of the newer tubes as you can see from the back it's an lg phillips tube whereas if you look at earlier crts uh, in okay, the av5 yeah, family yeah. they are just listed as phillips so this is post the lg phillips deal where they started working together uh, to create these products my bio vision one also has an lg phillips tube in it mm -hmm. uh Pre-2000, B&Os all seem to have just Phillips tubes, not the LG Phillips. Well, that's... That kind of gives yeah. you an idea of the age. Uh, the one that I had in America had a Hitachi tube. That's interesting. So that what you, the one you had was like an 80s model, I yes, think? Yes, so 80s. quite so, old, yeah. right? So, so that's yeah, like, I yeah. Think, and then every, but everybody else, everybody else beyond that has told me Phillips, just like you said. And by the way, Phillips... You might look at the name and not think much of it, but Philips was a a, a huge deal in yeah. the '90s and in the early 2000s. They were, they were basically like the biggest European manufacturer of electronics. They were very successful. They were one of the founders of the compact disc format alongside with Sony. I mean, they played a huge role. The, the compact cassette, like Philips, was a very influential and important company, and they were also LG Philips together was like the largest manufacturer of uh uh what is it of crt tubes in the world at the time like they were making so many tubes right so this they knew what they were doing they produced a lot of stuff they were good i like these these tubes uh they give a very what should i say i, I kind of describe it as an arcade like image right as right, long as you don't right. have the scan velocity modulation enabled it looks to me like an arcade monitor fed with rgb it's very, very nice. You know, not a super high line count. It doesn't look like a Trinitron, but it's a beautiful picture. Nonetheless, I, I'm a big fan. So we got that in there. Uh, so yeah, Mega Drive looks good. Sounds good. Running great on there. You know, the menu, it has software revision 3.1. So it's one of the newer B&Os in terms of software, which means the menu system is actually usable. Whereas the older models, I would describe the menu system as basically useless. It's extremely hard to parse and do anything. Um, you don't have to tell me that. I felt like, I literally felt like, uh, yeah, the whatever it is, just completely dumbfounded. Like I'd never messed with a television before when I was trying to use that remote control on that yeah. MX5000. Oh, no, absolutely. It's not like that on this and the newer sets. It's cool. quite easy to use, I would say. Um, so there's that. What else back there? Oh, yeah. If you look down at the bottom there, you see that red button? Yeah, I was going to say, what is that? A, that's the power button, like the main system power power level button, right? Okay. It's like a toggle switch. And then to the right of that is the power cable connector. So it's a figure eight plug, not that. Oh, that. that, yeah. Yep. 
But you see that little input you next to the right of the power cable? That bad boy is covered by plastic when the shell's this one? on. Yeah, it looks exactly like the DIN for a CDI controller as well. And that was actually the first thing we saw when we took the back cover oh, okay. off. Okay. Like, Wait, what is this mystery plug that is this covered right by the, the plastic? Love yeah, this. it's <laughs> it is uh, it's not user accessible by default, but it is right there. <laughs> um, so maybe let me jump to the next day actually, then because that's when we actually took the top off. I was like, all right, so we're gonna explore in here, see if we can figure out the CDI stuff. Uh, and actually, there's a question in here. It says, "Why do you think there's a CDI in it?" From JJ, because Phillips pushed it. I would yeah. actually say I believe B and O. They are a, a Dutch brand, right? Yeah, I think they are, right? And Philips—that's that, what I've always being thought. A Dutch company. Uh, it makes sense to me that that they would actually have sort of a collaboration on that. Right. Oh no, they're Dan They're Danish. They're in Denmark. Oh yes, that's right. Danish. And wait, where's where is Philips from? Are they are Dutch, right? I believe, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, but that's not too far away. Either way, for... they're not too they're not too far from one another. Um, so you've got the Dutch and the Danish working together on this. I'm not surprised they went together, especially given that you know Philips helped create the CD format in the first place. It makes sense to just go, why not CDI? You know, video CDs. How about all that stuff? Extra value in there. Well, I this, assume that's I, how I the think this happened. also would allow CDI to be able to push the limits of some of their like questions on how to maybe solve some issues on their hardware where B&O is not going to is is more about luxury so they're spending more and like just like the example yeah. we went through on the CD uh disc operation itself how unique that is it was all trying to push yeah. the envelope feels super premium and really, the CDI itself isn't really a, a platform designed specifically just for games, right? right? It was a whole multimedia thing. Games were just part of it, even if they weren't great. So I can see what they were trying to do there with it. It makes it makes somewhat sense to me. But anyway, jump ahead. Next day, it's like, all right, we, we got to get inside this TV because of, for a few reasons. One, we want to figure out if there's any way to fix the missing features on this system. Two, you know, as with any new new CRT that I get... You got to open it. You got to clean it. These things accumulate so much dirt and dirt and dust in there. Like you leave that stuff in there and running, it's just going to shorten the life of the tube. There's no reason to do that. Uh, and then three, I was just curious, like what's in this thing? Cause you know, it, it's gigantic and heavy. So we popped off the back. Uh, and that's what we found as you see in the photo, except for when I first opened it, it was horrifyingly dirty. <laughs> there was so much like that ashen black soot yeah. on all the cables all over the place collected the the focus knob down there by by the high voltage area you can't really see it in the photo it was it was just okay. caked in the stuff it looked black this is probably uh, to the, down to the left. oh it's on the other no, side no, no, it's to the left you can't see yeah, it in this okay. photo Around the corner there is where you find the flyback transformer, and then there's the focus knob next to it, separate. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I could see how it come in here. Oh, see, so they, they did a little bit different on this TV. But yeah, this whole this whole thing just always, especially to the seat, it all like funnels down into the back there, yeah. right? It's like it's hot, high heat, and it's it's attracting that dust down in there, almost like a, exactly. like a, a sucker into there for 20 years. Exactly. So that's, you know... So I was like, all right, we need to take this outside because <laughs> this is filthy. So we did. Uh, I compressed aired the heck out of it and got as much dirt out as I could. And it looks pretty good in the end. I wiped down all the cables with some isopropyl and paper towels and kind of tried to clean up that stuff. I actually really was impressed with the the cleanliness of the yoke design there. Like it's right. a really like nice, it's a really nice it's a nice looking yoke, right? Like it's just, it's on there. It looks good. I, it looks like it, it could do a lot neat. more than, than, than just a, yeah, it looks like it's got a way, uh, uh, some extra, extra parts in here that are possibly to me to design, to give you a little bit better of a look on the edges on a tube like this, to exactly. be honest. Exactly. That's what I gather. Like it, it looks like a pretty premium yoke and you can tell that they put a lot of engineering effort into this, uh, which is cool to see. And yeah, as you if you look at the back, you zoom out again. It is uh, very complicated, but I would say very well organized. 
Like I was yeah. actually really impressed with the way the wires are run throughout. Like there's a ton of circuit boards in here, but it's in sort of this U shape design, all held by that plastic chassis there. <laughs> um, which is, by the way, unfor most of it's like wood and metal, but like the boards are held in by plastic, and I hate old plastic like that. And that's why I was afraid to go too deep on this thing because once you start pulling the plastic parts out, as you well know, Steve, uh, that that old plastic it's very brittle, and it's super easy to break those clips off, right? Yeah. And I didn't want to do that right now. No, I don't blame you. And if it's uh, you know, this this you th look at. I've already seen it, the future of this TV. Look at this. You got a lot loads of surface mount capacitors in here. So I can just imagine the complexity in there. Um now what I will do is I will second exactly what you said about the way BNO designed these things. It does look incredibly intimidating at first, but uh they tended to make every single one of these plugs, even though there's a hundred of them, different. So you could yep, never yep. really plug in one in the wrong spot. And uh, I know that if you have the documentation for the TV, they would include wiring diagrams specifically for servicing. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. But as you say, due to the fact that they're using all these uh, different clips on there, uh, it's sorry, they use all the different plugs on these cables. It's, it's easy to not plug in the wrong cable into the wrong spot. Yeah. Everything's sized up just perfectly. They have these special unique connectors, everything there. It's awesome. So I had no troubles like connecting and, and reconnecting things, although the story about that in a moment. <laughs> now, one of the cool things about this set, though, I, I know right away is you see that little battery there on that backboard? I do, right there. Yeah, right. So that, that can actually be swapped out fairly easily. Mm -hmm. And that's key because that is the battery used for saving the settings of the TV. But it also serves as a timekeeper basically it's it saves the cdi settings i don't know how familiar are you are you with the cdi hardware i've never been able to actually acquire one since like all right so they're notorious for something called the timekeeper chip have you heard about this thing no i've not you can explain thing? it basically the cdi has a battery backup installed on the motherboard and that battery is what saves the settings and your save games and the cdi itself requires this to function correctly Here's the thing, that battery is inside of an integrated circuit. So there's a chip with the battery inside. It's actually inside the chip along with other components. What's the solution? Well, you could desolder it and put a new timekeeper in, but guess what? That's That specific IC is old and any of the ones that you find are likely going to also be old and that battery is going to be dead. The solution, you dremel the chip apart <laughs> until you reach the connectors you pull out the battery and then you hook up some you know solder and some leads to it put a little battery holder in there and uh swap a new battery and it's a huge pain in the butt and it's very destructive i hate it that's that uh, yeah that's insane i've never even every heard of cdi that. is like most cdis are like this uh that's why this BNO is very special because it doesn't have that. It has that little battery, a little coin cell battery that can be. It's it is soldered That's there with those connectors, replaceable. but you just you just desolder those little leads, swap in the new battery, and you're good to go. It's so much easier than the, the old method. <laughs> uh, so that is a huge plus side of this set is that you you actually have a, a replaceable battery. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I could it tell you that doesn't require dremeling. Yeah, and I could, could I could tell you that 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 the reasoning it was probably done like that is because it had the TV itself had to have the battery also, so they couldn't yep. say, "Well, we're going to integrate." It was already integrated in the TV. Every other BNO TV that I've ever seen has a battery in it, all the way back to the '80s yep, ones. Yep. 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 And what's cool, though, is that obviously this means then that the CDI components are integrated directly into these all these different boards that B&O built. So it's a it's a completely bespoke solution to the CDI, right? Like they're not right. just using some off the shelf Philips board like it's a real unique uh, design, which I thought was awesome. And from looking looking over the board myself, like the quality of the capacitors they're using seems significantly higher than those in a normal Philips CDI. Like there's some pretty decent components in there, uh, if which you know as it should be, it's an expensive TV, right? Right. But so that was awesome, and the picture quality is the best I've ever seen from a CDI. Okay. It's very very sharp and clear with the RGB direct feed. That's awesome. Uh, 
so we we've we've been through all that the next also if you look to the left and right of the tube mm -hmm. that is dual amplifiers yeah that's what i was gonna say that's what that looks like stereo amplifier right there yep and they're on the left and right and look at and them they're i mean and they're mounted look at that with, frame that, look at that frame, frame looks like so like like something out of a uh like hot hot rod motor or, i mean i know i know <laughs> It's like something out of an old car from like the seventies or something. Like a metal bracket yeah. of just five pounds of steel. It's got like a radiator on it. <laughs> Look at it this. Dude, I know, right? <laughs> Dual radiators. Oh my gosh. It's just freaking off. It's no freaking wonder it was awesome heavy. Now what what year is this one that you guys got? What you do you remember what my year was? guess is that it's 2000, 2001, actually. Okay. Uh around that time. As I so it's one of the later ones and that kind of gets to why we, one of the reasons we opened it up was like the missing controller ports which you've already seen up there yeah okay so basically here's what's going on like being that this is a late model and the cdi was probably dead by the year 2000 it's pretty obvious that b and o was like hey uh having cdi in our new tv probably not the best idea like who wants a Philips cdi at this point right so yeah i believe that as a result they simply decided to remove the feature. But in this model, they didn't actually remove it. They just disabled it. So by default, when you buy this thing, CDI games don't work. There's no controller ports. It's just a CD player. I guess video CD player possibly as well. That's it. Well, <laughs> this unit played CDI games. And I quickly discovered in the service menu, which you access by hitting menu, zero, zero, and then OK. You write into the service menu. There you uh, go. On the newer B and O's, it's simple. Um, there's a CD option. You go down there, and it's like CD mode. It's like audio or CDI. That's it. You just set it to CDI, and now the CDI player works. <laughs> uh, but you're still missing those controller yeah. ports. Right. And sure enough, if you ex when when we started exploring around there, you go back to the <laughs> rear picture. Um, you can see that. You want to bring up that rear picture? Again? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, I just closed it And then I'll show out. you. I'll show you. All right, the picture we were <laughs> just looking at. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we okay. go. Okay, so now, if you look back along the top there, that top area with all the buttons, right? That, you'll see uh, it's missing screws there because we unscrewed this whole, the whole thing, not just that area. The yeah, whole right thing here. has to clip off and it disconnects. And you see that all that mess of cables running up there, mm -hmm. those are all just connected to a pair of circuit boards up there. One for the buttons and one for the 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 inputs and such. Okay. And I just pe I peeked under the plastic lip, and sure enough, not only are there three RCA jacks under there, there's also the two. Oh, here we is go. Here we go. Picture? There it is. That's it. That's it. So you disconnect. You see, it's the back. That's the, this is the back that's, side. Those are the two boards you're talking about right there. Sorry. Let me get this yeah, picture that's the a little two bit boards. resized over here so that we can keep everything good. There we go. Yes, yeah, so there's the okay, two so boards. Okay, so we can't see the CDI port so easily from here, but what you can see is the top one is the is the headphone jack, and then yes. look at that. There's the three the three RCA jacks right there, covered by plastic, but they're they're there all the same. Right there. How about that? Yep. So there's so still that's on the what board. you saw. You just turned it around. And you're like, dude, they're right there, right? Yeah. And and then next to it has this video, and then below it and off the off the camera. It's the CDI ports. Okay. And you could, I mean, as you can see, plain as day, it's like they're right there on the circuit board. Right. So I pulled this whole. There's piece not even out any components over. missing, it looks like. It's all just populated no, and everything. Exactly. Everything was, I, I was, my first thought, and Audi in the car was like, oh, maybe they're still on the board or something and we can get in there. And I didn't want to crush his spirit so quickly. <laughs> uh, I was like, dude, thinking like, it's probably not there or. At best, the board has the spots for it, but everything's unpopulated. I that's honestly what I expected, right? Yeah. So I was genuinely shocked when I opened this up and saw this, and Audie's like smiling in the corner, like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why I was hugging that thing. Was exactly. he hugging it? Was he hugging it before you found absolutely... all this or after? Yeah, that was before. Oh, and then he okay. hugged it harder after. <laughs> um so Okay. Yeah, cool. so I popped this whole piece off, unplugged all the cables, went to work on it on my dining room table, uh, and got the uh those ports free. I freed the ports. 
Freedom with just uh, a Dremel. I I scuffed a little bit on the side there, yeah, no. and um, I That's need to good. sand it down a little bit, but it's it's enough. It doesn't look unless you look closely, you can't really tell much was done to it. It's fine. Uh, but here's the thing: one when I, I I did that, reassembled it, turned it on with the back still off, and we tried to boot up um, Tetris, and then nothing. It didn't work. No control. Sorry, the game worked, but the controller still didn't work plugged into the port. So I was like, well, shit, that's a bummer. How about we try Hotel Mario? Um, so I actually didn't have that. So we burnt an ISO real quick. Uh, came downstairs, popped it in, and same problem. It, the controller didn't work. And I was beginning to get, like, feeling disappointed by this, right? And I could tell Audi was also bummed out. We were like, well, it didn't work. So I went back around to the tv and that's when i noticed something you see that little white ribbon cable there coming from from the top this one that one there yeah yeah it was hanging loose i so didn't plug it in <laughs> you just didn't have it plugged in okay. I, I just i just missed it i didn't yeah. plug the cable in it was just hitting sitting there i was like wait a minute so i took it back off plugged the cable in turned around turned it all back on popped in uh hotel mario i plugged in the controller <laughs> it started to play the intro and i pressed the button and the intro skipped to the main menu and you guys were like and cheering. we all looked at each other like oh shit and then i got into the game <laughs> and it worked perfectly oh my goodness uh, and we were just like that's it it works it's fine yeah <clears throat> and that was the point actually when we decided to really clean it all out after that because we were feeling good about it Okay. So at this point, we had the whole thing open. We had the controller ports working. Uh, it sounded great. It looked great. There's just one thing missing, and that's the digital video card. But I didn't feel like exploring too deeply in it at the moment until I was sure that there was actually some sort of method for this. Mm -hmm. And so sure enough, somebody that seems to be an expert on these and has three of these was like on Twitter pretty much pointed out like, I think it was a uh, Scripach 007, their okay. name. So he says, yeah, the AV, uh, this model of AV5 still has the socket for the digital video card. It's buried on the CDI board somewhere above the subwoofer. Oh my so goodness. Well, I need to, I need to explore around and see if it's actually if I'm just missing something on the outside there or wait, if it's wait. actually like buried. Hey. It's the cards in there, you think, or what? The, the card is not there. So the digital video card is something that Philips sold separately. So can you still CDI find players. that? Yes, the cards you can get. Okay. You can get on eBay, right? There's there's different models of the card. There's the smaller, more compact version and then the larger one for the older CDIs. It seems that the smaller CDI cartridge, digital video cartridge, it's the digital video mini cartridge. That's what it's called apparently that does plug into this unit on the back and they simply oh omitted gosh. it because well it wasn't intended to play cdi games anymore but the port is still there so the next step which we don't have it yet we need to obtain uh one of these dvc cards and that's it it should slot right in and work it's unreal and but without that card i can't play thunder in paradise so sorry <laughs> there Bob. we go that's the reason so that's that's just unreal that <laughs> it's it's that capable and that you have basically discovered what may be the ultimate like CDI collectible, I would think. Kind of, yeah. And <laughs> here's the thing. Apparently, these AV5s, like the older ones that had the full CDI support out of the box, yeah, those are the CD players often not working in them. So this is actually an old, this is a newer model. So it's more recent components. It has the newer LG Philips tube. The components seem more robust and you can restore CDI functionality to it. So it kind of seems like the best of all worlds. Exactly. So, wow. So did you even try, my one question was going to be, during any of that time period when you guys were messing around with the controller ports, did you ever try that? port down at the bottom with the back off yeah we did try that and, and it did absolutely nothing okay 
the CDI controller plugged into it, but my guess is that it's something else entirely. Probably. I don't actually know what it is. I need to research that, but I was a little bit confused by the port. It's probably CDI related, given that it's hidden by the plastic again, but I, for what reason? I don't know. I need to check on it. Okay. And then what about for a remote control on this television? Did you use your same uh, old uh, Universal or the well, one you have? No, no, no. It, it came with its own BO4 remote. Okay. Which is, um, it's this one, basically, which I have right here. Okay. Uh, it's the same so as this that? this one is almost the same. Mine is a little bit newer. It has VMEM and AMEM as well. Because I've got a His picture of that here. His had the DVD this one? Yeah, it's that one. But you see where it says VMEM? On the AV5 remote, it actually says V-tape. So mine is a bit newer, and it came with the BO4 that has like doesn't mention uh, cassette tapes any or sorry VCR tapes anymore. Okay. VHS tapes, not VCR tapes. VHS tapes. So his still has the V tape button on it, suggesting it is probably from around like 2000 or so. And by the way, for those looking at the remote there, the, the thing is like a solid block of aluminum. Oh yeah, like, I I brought got like zinc coating or something on it. It's yeah, ridiculous. well, just to give like it hasn't. It's it's funny how it they they went with a remote design and obviously kept it because this is the one I had to use with the TV I was working on, and you can tell it looks almost the same just without the screen. Whoops, went too far. It does look about the same, but, but and it's the layout super, is worse. Right, the layout's worse, but it's super like you said, super heavy and dense. And I actually brought it so when I. At the Retro World Expo, I told you I had to give back the person who paid me to service their uh, TV, which is that that's behind it, the 5,000. And right. I gave him the TV, and then like he calls me five minutes later. He's like, I forgot to get the remote. I'm like, oh, yeah, we definitely need that. And yes, so I took it back up to our booth, and I let people like feel it and hold it, and they're just like b blown away with how it's dense and heavy it is. What is it made out of? It's like aluminum, like zinc coated aluminum or yeah. something. Okay. So it stay the reason is is that the zinc helps it retain coolness. So in your hand, even <laughs> in your warm hand, the remote always feels kind of cold, which is nice. Uh this thing's a beast, honestly. I freaking love these remotes. Uh, they're really, really nice to use. Um so but yeah, yeah that's, there's that's there, a but huge there's plus. a good example right there of how this remote still has V tape. Says, yeah. Yeah, right yeah, there. yeah. And it actually says other things. I didn't understand any of this stuff. ABC store. For a All second, right, so, I thought I was going shopping, like through the, the remote or something. So the main thing with these remotes, you got to remember, is that they're designed for the whole BO link system right. and all the different B&O components. That's what that one port on the back of the TV is mm -hmm. that's unusual looking, is that you actually connect it up to other B&O systems. Um and that's like you know I've... your hi-fi gear cd players all this stuff it's all meant to link together and you use this one remote to change it yeah so that's kind of the idea uh which is cool so yeah that's the bo vision or the i guess the whatever they call it, the av av5 av5 I, I i don't know if they have the bo vision name attached to it but no, the BO I love, Center. Sorry. I love this. Uh, so we're looking now at boworld.org, specifically at the yeah. AV5. To, and it, it tells you the manufacturer's years. Like you say, you guys have a later one. I love how it gives like the d designer credit. Yeah. Wouldn't exactly. it have been so cool? I wish I could find like this guy and do an interview with him just to talk about the whole design process. I wonder if, I mean, because it seems like there was as much detail put into this as like they would have done with uh bridge design and other yeah. things oh yeah building design architecture it's definitely um an emphasis of this this whole line of televisions and there's a yeah, lot of these... tons of information here on this particular unit i do like that it does have multiple colors that i, I mean a green I one know. that would be crazy and a blue and i'm guessing it's a blue like wood still that just looks yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I think they all use that pearlescent paint. So, so, on the wood. So yeah, this thing, it's it's extra premium feeling, and it just looks cool. Like if you gotta have a CRT in your place, the fact that it's a stand-up unit also means that you don't need to set it on anything. 
and it's very narrow at the bottom and it it just has this it looks like a monolithic object with a crt stuck through it like mm-hmm. it's really like it almost looks like an art piece <laughs> more than a piece of uh living room gear right and and just looking at some of the things on here from um this has always been an emphasis of bno2 is to make a flat crt because well. the one from the 80s well not flat on the screen but flat as in thinner and um this like you said is a 25 inch and here's what i've always heard and this might speak to this a little bit more on why this is like set at this 25 26 inch size is that once you get over that threshold on the size it almost becomes impossible without extending that tube length to get the focus geometry and convergence specifically along your edges of your pictures to look um good and so exactly. that helps uh i think that they were they were like that's the max kind because that's most of them i see are in that format yep i think that's i think anything above 25 inch is just a bit too much for the chassis uh though i think they did a 28 version of the 9000 which I can talk about a little bit because uh, okay. there's some experience with that. Yeah, so we could switch over now from the AV5 and uh, why don't you th- search for the Bio Center or the Bio Vision 9000 on there? Okay, let me see. see if you can find it. Actually, you can just Google. Let me see if I can find the Bio Vision 9000 and okay. Bio World. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, so. Um, Okay, I found it. Okay. Oh, wait, no, that's the Bio Vision Nine Thousand. That's a different. That's a different thing. Let me see here. Ah, there it is. The Bio System AV Nine Thousand. Okay. We can send you the link. Yeah, send Discord. me that link, and then I'll just. There it is. Okay, cool. I'll just pull that up, and then I'll flip that over. There we go. And so this one is manufactured earlier. This is an older, an older unit. Right. Okay. Uh. So here's my experience with this thing. So I obviously, I got my bio vision one, so I'm kind of sold on being at this point, this thing comes up for sale or sorry, it comes up for free. Uh, and I was like, dude, to my, so my buddy Thomas, who is also now into CRTs, thanks to me. Sorry. <laughs> I clogged his living room full of stuff now. Um, I was like, yeah, dude, be there's an AV 9,000 for free. Right, it's an older model, yeah, but like, look at that. Oh my! And goodness. honestly, the the photos don't do it justice. No, they don't at all. When right I, there. When I first saw this thing in person, it is, I think it might be one of the most beautiful CRT displays I've ever laid eyes on. It is just such a gorgeous design, like really beautiful. Like I, man, it, it it's shockingly good looking in person. Just an awesome, awesome design. Um, but of course, and it comes in two parts uh thomas made the mistake of going down there by himself though Mm -hmm. (laughs) to bring it back to his house um i'm actually on so he drives like a smart for four right so it's a fairly small car and somehow he managed to get it in there and back home and i'm just like in awe like how did you actually pull that off well he did it either way with much frustration but then there's a problem so he gets it home he can't get anything to work so there's actually turns out that there's there's two parts to this problem and boy is it frustrating first of all the guy that gave it to him he gave him a third party remote uh it does some functions but not all by losing the original remote however it means that there's a lot of stuff on this tv that you cannot access at all right yeah including including the additional inputs you can't do it. You can't get to any of the other inputs except for like the first one. Uh, which brings us to our second problem. The first input was damaged. The SCART socket is damaged. Somebody obviously put weight on it. Yeah. So there's loose solder joints inside, right? So you can kind of wiggle it and get a picture, but it's not stable. So the only way to to access, to get a good picture on this TV is you got to plug it into one of the other SCART sockets. And you need a BO4 or, you know, one of the BO remotes to select the right input. That's it. Which wouldn't be a problem if you didn't have 
if you had the remote, uh, but he doesn't. And that third party remote doesn't work with it. Um, it also, so that's see, said you can, it, it, can the remotes like, can the remote you have work, work with this it one? It does. Okay. Yeah, it does. We tested it. We found out like, oh, oh that does actually work. Uh, actually, I sh let me correct myself though. The second SCART socket can be used if the pin for uh, auto selection is hooked up on the SCART line itself. Like, yeah. you know how SCART plugs have, have that sort of auto selector circuit or whatever? Uh, I did. If that pin is hooked up, it'll actually work. The problem is, is if you're using like a, a SCART selector or anything like that, for some reason it doesn't seem to pass that over. So he could only hook up one machine at a time to the SCART input, which is kind of a pain in the butt. So the real solution is, you know, get just get the remote, which we're working on, but they're kind of expensive to obtain those remotes. Though considering you got the TV for free, you know, what's a remote cost, I'd say, right? It's like whatever. Yeah, and that is a, that's always going to be probably a big difficult thing for people trying to get this television is, one, the challenge of needing the remote. And that's what I taught. I wrote... An article about I did a video on the BNO restoration, but I also wrote an article for Retro RGB where I included a little bit more information I didn't get to in the video. And it, it was the two big challenges of this thing it is the obviously complexity of the TV and the fact that they're older and you're, you're yeah. kind of hoping that everything still works on them right now. Yeah. But we're all coming to this point where this stuff in the next decade is going to need to be kind of taken care of to some level. And then the remote controls. Yep, yep, yep. The two biggest hurdles, yeah, kind of. Yeah. I, I, it was so frustrating trying to figure this out. I think, um, I thought Thomas was going to explode in a rage. <laughs> He's just like, I have had enough of this, and I don't blame him because it was. But we did at least isolate the problems. It is the lack of remote and the SCART socket, right? So once that's solved, it'll be just fine. Uh, but we actually tried to fix the scart port i brought my soldering iron and all my gear over yeah so let me just try to fix this and then i popped off the back and you thought the back of the av5 <laughs> was complex the inside of this thing was so insane it was a frankenstein of circuit boards and you know what steve i bet you know exactly what i mean because it's probably not far off from the one you just worked on where it's just all these boards hanging on plastic sliders <laughs> A million cables everywhere uh but this thing also has an amp in it as well, as well. Yeah. and uh the base has a vcr in it oh my goodness uh, so the whole thing is just this gigantic mess of cables uh yeah and well here's the problem is like it, the scart sockets are like connected they're on this they're mounted on this plastic piece which is then mounted directly to the board and the only way to service the scart port is to basically take all of that out and due to the way it's mounted in there, it would require like taking a ton of stuff apart. And I started to do it a little bit, but then plastic clips started breaking off, just like crumbled beneath my fingers. And I was like, well, shit, I can't, I didn't really want to get in there and, and break this thing down because I was afraid I would destroy the entire plastic caging with, and without that, like, how do you even get those parts to stay in there? Yeah. And what's crazy is that this was based on an MX design, like the whole chassis mx based okay. but with extra stuff on top of it so they actually added in this whole like mounted system with extra inputs and plugs for the stereo stuff that's just mounted inside a plastic cage it's literally like hanging in place and clipped onto the other plastic cage and it's it's all slots together in this crazy way uh that it actually kind of scared me off from pulling it all apart to fix the scart socket so I was like, you know what? Let's just leave that scart socket alone and focus on getting the remote sorted so that we can just use the <laughs> other scart inputs instead, yeah. which is where we're at now. I think that's a good idea for now, yeah. I'll <laughs> tell you, when when I opened the B&O for the first time, that's what I said. I said, oh, you know, my head just kind of dropped. I was like, this is going to be quite a challenge. And I can give a little bit of advice on, for example, when you have to service that kind of a TV and that kind of a setup. Uh, the Naturally, there is a design back here in these boards, and I'll pull up the picture you had here for, as an example, just the back of the TV we had been looking at, the AV5, right. as a good example here, because it's not much different than 
uh, the MX five thousand. But yeah, it's a lot of com- compacted boards. Uh, but there is th- there is one thing I've learned over the years by servicing CRTs. There's generally a way to get like ninety percent of these clips out of the exterior, and then you could pull this whole board setup as one cluster out. And there's about five connection points. But the problem is you're pulling everything out then. But that yes. way I could safely set that whole cluster of massive boards down and slowly follow the manual to pull it all apart. Whereas if you had been working on these all your life, if you were being O-Tech, you would know how to go, okay, disconnect this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, pull this tab here, and the door swings open and slide the board out, right? But that's yep, it's yep, like... Yep. You don't know that anymore. So until you learn that, it's it's definite. And, and like you say, this plastic, there's there's plenty of oh. there's plenty of. Uh, I, I had to work on a PVM for Bob this last weekend, and I was laughing because I had worked on it before, and it's a 14L5, which has a okay, bracket yeah. in it that falls apart all the time. It holds the deflection card in place, and. I had worked on it before and I was laughing oh, no. because I reopened this PVM and I I had to hold the whole half of this thing together with like four huge strips of electrical tape. And I was just oh, hoping no. to say, oh, look, there's this lovely electrical tape, <laughs> electrically taped oh, held on thing here for you, Bob. Still in here. But uh, yeah, it's it's that's that's like the worst part about messing with this stuff is the fact that there is extremely brittle plastic i'm always nervous messing with yep, these connection yep. points too even on the boards you know, it's yeah because those things will snap off if you're not careful hey peace oh, your man. buddy showed up oh there he is yes <laughs> thanks for coming we, in we've I, been we've been gushing about your tv for 45 minutes i know man he, <laughs> this is like the greatest purchase he will ever make. <laughs> will he ever get it back from you, John? <laughs> no, absolutely. My goal is to make this thing as clean and complete and functional as possible so uh, that when the day comes that he gets to transport it up to his house, everything just works. Man, well, I just hope That's that the idea. like somehow we could get our stuff working together. I'd be able to come over here and look at that thing. So that would be awesome, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, actually, w- one of one weird thing is you see on the right there, you can see the exposed motor, and the the right there. Well, not the that's the, the CD lens. The motor for the spindle is actually oh, below it, right there, right there. But, <laughs> but there's actually supposed to be a little plastic cover for the top part. Yeah, that goes there. It was missing when we got it, but like I always wondered why that was. There was a little plastic cover there because that's not a usable, accessible thing to get that out you have to disassemble the unit right yeah so like why is there a little cover there well and the fact that and if it's not there and if it wasn't there when you opened it and if it looked like it wasn't there it might have been something where the guys were assembling it in the factory they're like this part's stupid and they just popped it off because it maybe it got in the way of assembly (laughs) you never know yeah maybe so but god man just open I just freaking love the, the I inside can't believe of this, this TV. Look down how here good too. that looks. Look it's how crazy. Good this looks. It's just a, just a beautifully engineered chassis in there. Like the whole thing is just awesome. I love the look of that. Everything about it is is unreal. And the I think a lot of people in when I noticed this going live to shows this last weekend when Bob and I had these CRTs like wide open like this, and especially the hugely complex ones we had these little bvms and you know a nine inch d9 and then a 1405 we had them open up working on them and there's so many boards in there people just stop and are like what the heck is like some people were coming over asking yep. if it was like a whole computer i was like no that's just yeah, yeah, a yeah. monitor that's yep. it yep and no, these are somebody... like amazing compared to the anything in the united I states i try to tell people that this is there you'll not this this is like the same level you'll see inside of like the NEC XP line and XM line of professional yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of monitors. It's super well built. Somebody said they're nice, but just Philip Philips rebrands. But I think that just applies to the tube. The tube, as we mentioned earlier, is indeed LG Philips, but you know they make great tubes. I wouldn't have expected B and O, given their low volume numbers, to be able to support 
their own CRT factory back no in the way. day, right? Like, like there's no way in heck they were gonna make the CRTs themselves. Uh, but I think they did make all the other components because it's all bespoke stuff. Although I do wonder, you notice the plastic housing there? We were just complaining about the plastic stuff, right? Did you notice how like all these TVs have that same smooth gray plastic used to hold these components in? It makes me wonder if there's some manufacturer out there that just like specialized in making CRT circuit board cages out of that smooth gray plastic. Yeah. <laughs> Cuz it's all the same even in like the PVMs and the BVMs and well, not so much the the BVMs, they use crazier stuff, but like mm-hmm. I I see that plastic in every one of these freaking monitors it feels like. Well, all yes, and well, either PVMs even have a plastic tray in every single one of them. That's the same. They absolutely like, do. Yep. yep. And and uh, actually, a couple of them for the power supply too. But you just going back to that Philips thing. Uh, let's take it from B and O's perspective. You're not going to make your own tube that's going to be better than these other companies that have been doing. I mean, these companies have been doing it for sixty years at this point. You know, right. Philips, all them. Your choice is then to go to. The only other thing they may have done would have been go to Sony and try to get them yep. to put it in Trinitron. And maybe it just couldn't work out like that. And they had a better option here, uh, closer to them, uh, working with Philips. So, yeah, I, I think my guess is that Philips was one of the biggest CRT manufacturers in the world. Yeah. And they're right next door country wise. And they were less, com- they weren't competing to the same level as Sony on this kind of audio equipment stuff. Like, I'm not sure that they could have forged a good deal with sony that would have worked in their favor you know because i feel like sony would not have been too excited about providing uh affordable tubes to a, such a competition for the premium market could could you imagine though if they would have had it and there would have been like a playstation one and a t with rgb <laughs> you know that's right that's the way it could have been i guess if it would have been the- oh god dude imagine that right like <laughs> yeah. this was a C- cdi but if they had done like a freaking playstation instead like how much how incredible that would have been how crazy would have been if you would have been the kid in europe with like a in 2000 with a playstation built into your tv you would have been yeah. the coolest kid like i'm actually i'm curious about how the cdi hardware is connected to this thing i the based on the cables i i theorize that it might just have like a plug going directly from the cdi circuit board up to the neck board mm-hmm. you're just like getting that direct raw connection right i don't know i would feel like with this tv the way i've seen them designed before there's a main uh, it looks like the other one just a little bit more complex that i worked on so i'd be interested to see he didn't get the guy didn't have any documentation with it did he oh uh, dang did he? Oh wait, no. did this guy? Yeah. 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 Uh, so oh, that's even the best part. The guy hands us a little baggie with like this leather wrapped uh manual booklet. Oh. You open it up and it's got all the manuals and books inside still. They look brand new. Well, I would definitely say in there how it's built. So Somewhere. I'll, I'll need to look <laughs> I'll need to look around in there and see what yeah. I can find. But so yeah, this thing is freaking interesting, and now I wish I had one of these myself. But I'm just going to hold too. on to Audis until he can get it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. But they're really they're they're not that easy to find these AV5. Specifically, yeah, specifically how long how long did you guys like find out about this TV and had been looking for it? Uh, they've shown up occasionally over the years, but it's pretty uncommon. And they were usually really far away, so we didn't want to do it. But being that that he was here just this time and it was relatively close uh i figured like this is the time to do it yeah. but if you actually look around you'll mostly just find the mx series of uh bnos which are like the cheapest one like the yeah. mx whatever right like th- that's like that's the entry level bno tv and then you step up to the higher levels from there and this is definitely one of the higher levels i would say the only downside to B&O is like after, you know, early 2000s when they started to get into the widescreen models and the larger Avant series, they switched to 100 hertz. So there's like a certain model year, a certain threshold where after you pass that threshold, they kind of suck because they're just 100 hertz TVs. Yeah. Um, just stay away from them. If you want more details on that, check out. <laughs> have you have you seen a RGB Rob by the way? YouTube channel RGB Rob. Sure. The I mean, he's old school, right? The, the Australian. Yeah. Like, he's been doing him. this for like. He's th- been doing dude. it for longer than I have. Funny enough, like I used to I watch know, like his videos before me. Years. Yeah. I love I love Rob's channel. It's amazing. If he catches this, just say, like, <laughs> oh, 
thank you for doing it for so long, dude, because I love it. But he actually, one of his videos, he did open up one of those Avants and take a look at it. And as suspected, it is the typical 100 hertz nonsense. No light guns. Uh, you know, it scales up 240p to 40 i uh, It's not the best. But... Yeah. Yeah, Lewis keeps running into ones that are the 100 hertz models, and I keep telling him, don't even, why are you even talking about it? It's just try to find the non yeah. ones. Uh, but you get the a only super thing with chat, the hundred hertz. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say I believe be on some of them it might be possible. I know it is with the Louvers. Yeah. But on some of those you can actually get like 480p input. Okay. So then it's 480p 60. So there's specific hundred hertz models where if you get the right one, it actually will accept HD input. Uh, and those can be useful for those, you know, if you're, if you're looking for 480p stuff, then that might actually make sense. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was a super chat from Tony Escobar a little bit ago. He said, awesome oh, yeah. dialogue on an intriguing CRT. My brother-in-law is from Holland and loves the CDI. Great interview, Steve. And John's a gifted storyteller. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. Oh, thanks, Tony. Yeah. Coming there's a, there, you. there's a. There's a lot of questions. I, I don't, you know, because this is stuff all that ended up more in Europe than anywhere around me, which is always yeah, fascinating. That's, that's the bummer, right? Like, you know, I grew up in the U.S. and I remember oogling all the top end CRTs, but I feel like they didn't really. Not many companies made these like luxury style CRTs in the U.S. Like, you had the high end Sony's, which are awesome, but like this kind of luxury, almost art piece design for a CRT with this kind of crazy sound and stuff. Like, I, do they even exist really over there? I feel like I don't recall them at all, but they're huge here. No, and, and I remember, so I remember growing up and it was, um, we didn't have, we weren't like well off. So we had always lower end CRTs and nearly everybody did, or it was a console TV. And then the only thing I remember was my, like my grandparents were well off and they had, when it was new, those four by three like I think it was a Mitsubishi box TVs with an early projector, oh, and yeah, it was yeah, yeah, yeah. awful, awful. Yeah. And just that was more of the fascination was trying to get it bigger than like a luxury yeah, thing. I quality. felt like actually that's an interesting point because over here, obviously, you know, living space is a little tighter than in the U.S. I suppose, and yeah. uh, so CRTs were generally smaller. Though I mean, they they did still sell big ones, but. It wasn't so much focused on size and stuff like rear projection was really rare over here. I think they were not popular for good reason. I would yeah, they're say because they're not. I, I don't like using rear projection sets by and large. They're pretty horrible. <laughs> yeah, I just but, remember that my grandmother now, and this is my grandmother. She was the first person I ever saw play Nintendo. The same grandmother. Oh, and, nice. And she made us. I went. I remember being a kid going and visiting her house for christmas and she had mario on the nintendo and we had never seen it before and she was sitting there playing and she made us watch her play for like an hour until she got tired of it and then Dude, she finally oh passed gosh. it to us and let us but the first thing i wanted to do was go hook it up to that big tv and she would never let me she was always like no that'll mess up that big tv and it, oh yeah so I never got to enjoy it on that terrible Actually, so big 4 I, by 3 so set. What I understand, the the reason rear projection burnt in is because they used those three small CRTs, but they to get it bright enough to see it, they had to run them at like an insanely high luminance level, which of course CRTs can burn in, but when you're running the brightness so high, yeah. they burn in way faster. <laughs> and I think they were like three white crt or like monochrome crts with color filters right like if i recall right like a, a lot green, of them were like green, that blue. they were they would just have lenses over top of the two yeah like a color lens so i'm not sure if that even you know would eventually warp from heating and coloring i'm sure it did eventually on those older ones yeah exactly so that stuff was tricky although i do remember it's not i wouldn't say it's quite luxury like this but it was pretty high end is when i grew up my cousins had I think it was the 40 inch Mitsubishi direct view CRT. So not rear projection, but it was in a large wooden case designed like a rear projection TV, but it was an actual 40 inch tube. Oh my gosh. You mentioned that. Hey, it was the Wade. <laughs> I remember playing uh Sega Genesis over there, like playing Sonic and just being oh my in goodness. Office. We had like a 27 TV at home, yeah. which I thought was big enough, but then I go there and I'm just like, 
my god this is <laughs> like it's so big like sonic's as big as my head now it was unbelievable at the time yeah. and i always loved that tv but they're obviously very heavy on wheels at least but good luck getting them upstairs <laughs> yeah right you, it's, you're right exactly a wood ca a solid wood chassis with speakers and a 40 inch tube <laughs> good lord <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> well uh john i'm not sure how you're doing on a time we're ahead about an hour we can uh we can start to start to want, wind down. Yeah, perhaps, let's. We'll uh, we'll probably switch gears, give it a couple more minutes, and then we'll let John go and uh, enjoy the rest of his evening there. And I'll get to back to work here in the shop in the United States time. But oh, yeah. um, definitely, thanks for coming on and talking about this awesome TV and these B and O things. Um, I, you know, a lot of the things that I would just add to the conversation have been things that I've already mostly published. If anybody else wants to go check out on it. Um, anything else i've done on my basically channel the last couple of weeks so they can find that without having to regurgitate it here uh but i do think it's awesome uh only thing i'll mention is that bno tried with the one that i worked on to come into yeah. the united states in the late 80s and for some reason that just didn't work at all and i don't know if it was the fact that like we said america was not ready for a luxury television at that time i'm not sure but uh that one didn't work and they just left the marketplace. So that's, that was a quick hit and then they're gone. So B and O is in the U S though, right? Like, yeah, um... they have, they used to have, uh, cause I talked to some people in the convention. I never, um, I'm not from the Northeast traditionally. I don't know that area growing up as much. Um, my, I go as far as basically Virginia where I'm at now, but when I go up in the Northeast, at these conventions and talk to people they'll bring up that when they were younger they would have bno stores in the mall and they were mostly audio yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. right so there's also like bno uh, stereos are still probably used in in uh, certain vehicles and things I so think they sell a lot of different headphones yeah. and sound bars and things like that i see i got a pair of bno in-ear headphones that are pretty solid i would say yeah um what do they have on televisions I... oh yeah they're doing those really weird looking uh oled tvs with like strange chassis and such are which... currently you mean yeah here let me let me send you this link here okay uh you can show people what they're doing now okay the... it's basically about looks about integrating speaker systems into um into an oled you see that? Oh, so, <laughs> wait a second. From what I've yes. seen, though, like that first one there, I, I feel like that might be the case of where like the speakers and stuff would actually move when you turn it on, possibly. But like it's focused on like sound quality and TV together. And they're still doing these like this is so units awesome. on a stand. They have, I mean, oh, wait, they, they still have one here, a $25,000 television, 77 inch OLED. <laughs> Oak wood. Oh, scroll down let's see what other what else do they have any videos of this oh yeah there we oh go oh my gosh what? yeah see there, look at that <laughs> oh it like it covers itself what? up that's what? right what? the wood actually serves as like a, a tv oh, screen cover then it rises gosh. up and it, you got speakers back there i'm just mesmer yeah look it folds open you have I mean, to. We have that, to admit. I when I, you know, back looking at that's what we pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, looking at what we've seen so far, I get like yeah. the, I get the totally. I feel like the origination of these designs came directly from uh, like 2001: A Space Odyssey, the monoliths yeah. in it does Stanley feel Kubrick. Way. It feels like that's what I get feeling, especially going from the early to like now. It's yep, just yep. a progression of that. And I mean, gosh, I, I, the two. I know. <laughs> 17, I respect man. them for this for doing this, is this so kind of awesome. stuff though, because like TVs today are just now like a black rectangle, right? Yes. Like, there's basically no defining visual characteristic. So like by trying to do something like this, this, which is completely off the wall, they literally talk movement. about choreographed movement in a TV. This, yep. Look at that stuff. Oh, I mean, there it's... you go. So don't complain about the remote control being cheap or expensive on the old sets because it's three seventy five on the new ones. <laughs> and it's, I, yeah. it's as big as ever. Look at it. 
Oh yeah, yep, it's still it's still. Look at that. Oh, look, you could even choose still your still a slab. <laughs> it's still got I the screen at the top. I love it, man. God, it's expensive as heck. A uh, four. Uh, if you get the bronze tone, it's four fifty for a remote. <laughs> So yeah, they're they're still out there, gents. I mean, and they're I'm sure make, that if you want to, products. if you want to, you can buy it as an American now. I'm sure, probably. Yeah. So that the B and O AV5 CRT we were just talking about, I believe the original list price was like 3,500 euro back when in like the early 2000s, uh -huh. which would have been around the time when the euro became a thing as well. So I don't know what it would have been in like Deutschmark, but. With inflation, I think it comes to around eight thousand dollars. Mm -mm -mm. So that you know, it was an eight grand TV, <laughs> and now, as you can see, well, they they sell a twenty grand. I mean, they're TV. yeah, right. Their their base models start at about eight grand. Still. It's a forty eight inch for almost eight thousand dollars. Wow! And it probably is an LG panel in there, but so what? Like that's you know. <laughs> They make great panels, but it's not just about the panel, right? What is this? I mean, but this is this is way too rich for my blood. Oh yeah, oh you can like customize all kinds of stuff on here. It's basically like buying an automobile these days, where you're choosing all the materials for the dashboard and such. Right, and you still get the, you the they still got the great options. stand. You, you know? still got the stands. And, I would still the, go with oh the floor stand. Expert. I mean, it wow. looks freaking cool. I gotta say. I gotta say that too. I would. I mean, this would be one of the best modern television factories to go check out, right? Uh, aside, I would from, love to see what they're doing. Aside yeah. from anything, even, I bet they have an awesome like museum or you know, like a corporate museum. I that I would has, love. To, I would love to see it. Yeah. Well, that that's a lot yeah. of fun, and uh, I think that's probably an awesome point here. We could jump off. Wait, John, some, if it's a, somebody oh, wait. just noted RGS in the chat says the CRT Avant was released in the U.S. around late 2000. So it seems like B and O brought out at really? least one other model. The Avant oh, for that. the. I see that. That's comment. interesting. So I guess they did a few others then, but it was pretty rare overall. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean that's just the only one I had ever found. I didn't, I don't know exactly what the whole reasoning they left, why they didn't bring more, or what happened to all the ones that were over here, and if any more made it. Um, Although, man, when I, you, you know, the B and O stuff is pretty pricey, but I remember when I bought my recent AV receiver. I'm, there's a huge AV store downtown yeah. that specializes in everything from entry level to like the highest of the high end, and like they're like uh special speaker room has like we're talking speakers that are like a hundred grand in there and okay. i've never seen anything like it the yeah. designs are so off the oh, wall I'm i so saw, gigantic I, I, you're I, like what even is this i saw one of them at a tech show that was a um it was it called like a nautilus speaker or, or something yeah, the it was a hundred yeah, 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 yeah. grand and it was like a sh nautilus shell huge yep, on yep, a special yep. stand one of them yeah way so there's weird. a bunch of speakers in that category and they all cost like that and i saw yeah. them all in a room together and i'm just like i walked in and pretty much just walked back <laughs> out and said i guess i will not be shopping in this room yeah i mean just even like this little home speaker from them on their ferrari pack powerful rory bass and sound from this little cylinder and it's 5500 bucks so it's not nothing's really cheap from them oh I bet it sounds good though. I bet it does given too. What I've heard. I mean, but you, I would really look weird. if I if I saw this in a place, I wouldn't even know what the heck it was, like till you turned it on, uh, right? Yeah, I I'm hundred percent because it has a Ferrari no. logo on it, and it looks like again a traffic cone. It looks like the fanciest traffic cone in the world. Yeah, man. So yeah, welcome <laughs> to the world of this weird premium stuff where you're just like, yeah, that's a uh, it's a little outside of my range. Yeah, well, there we can all <laughs> dream, right? One day. That's what you do if you buy if you win the lottery, buy the B and O. <laughs> all right. Oh, goodness. Well, is all that right. all right? Let's uh yeah. Right. Let's if that's all right, it. let's close it down. Thank you everybody for joining today. If you came in uh recently and want to go back and watch the rest of the show, you can go back to the beginning. Please drop us a like. And as always, go follow John on Twitter. And I'm sure everybody here knows about Digital Foundry, but in case you're somebody who's been under a rock and found a CRT stream today and want to know more, go check out Digital Foundry and uh all over yep. the internet. And thank you again, John, for being here. I really appreciate of course. it. 
I had a great time. Always happy to jump on. Excellent. Well, then we'll have to have him come back for sure. <laughs> you heard it. All right. All right, guys. See More you later.